morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Rebecca Thorne. I'm back again today to do another critique uh, from someone from my Discord server. Uh, these are Maya's pages. I'm excited to read them today. Um, deepest apologies, Maya, because I know that you sent these to me like three weeks ago, and uh, I definitely was over ambitious three weeks ago and hope to make that up to you today. Um, anyway, these are the most recent pages from Maya. I have a query letter and a and 2,000 words, I think. Um, and so I'll be reading through the 2,000 words first, and then if we have time at the end, um, I'll take a look at the query letter and see what we can see. Um, I, if you guys see me looking to the left, it's because my my like actual screen over here for like technical stuff is over on the left. Um, but I'm going to try and stay focused over here. So let me go ahead and share this screen really quick. Um, okay, there we go. Um, that should work. All right. Okay. Then, chapter one, from the desk of Miss Laya Camille, Cigna City, Altain, uh, 16 Deb Debadonna, 1125. I like that, that's cool. Uh, Tell me again, the security investigator says as his eyes hone in. I let my, bre my breathing slow, imagining cool tr water trickling down my back, just like Igna Ignatius, Ignatius, yeah, Ignatius, taught me. A simple lie detector test is easy to beat, but I'm not trying today. Today, I have nothing to hide. Good thing, too. The cuffs on my hands measure my pulse, and that's the part I could cheat. But these, uh, those eyes, those eyes are unrelenting. He wears bionic contacts. Oh, cool. So immediately I know it's sci-fi. Um, he wears bionic contacts, all the better to measure my hesitation in, any, in my manner, uh, the slightest dissembling. All the better to measure any hesitation in my manner, the slightest dissembling. Um, not normally pulled for, out for a routine security update, but apparently this to the counter intel office, not a usual security screen. Ignatius and I started writing two years ago, I repeated. I repeat, uh, I've kept your office informed about the frequency and nature of the correspondence. No face-to-face -face calls? I start to shake my head, think better of it, and verbalize. We know suspicions run high between Valhar and Eltane. No reason to get ourselves in a situation where it's only our, our word we haven't discussed, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. I'm, I am still drinking my coffee. So if I like stutter over this, it's probably because it's early in the morning for me. Um, no reason to get ourselves in a situation where it's only our word. We haven't been discussing anything inappropriate. A paper trail, so to speak, is best, right? He narrows his, uh, those eyes. I imagine one swinging light bulb, ponderous and pregnant in its desire to crash into my head. Damn you, Ignatius. You keep getting to live your life all lordful and high, and I'm always the one left scrambling to explain. What did he say about the new position, he asks. His ascension? I had no idea what it was happening. He said nothing at all, except he'd need to stop writing for a while. Ten days later, I heard the announcement. And then the interrogator steeples his fingers, assessing me. I haven't heard from him since, for the last six months. He scoffs and makes a note in his tablet. But I've already told you this already, I say, finally allowing myself some irritation. This is a scheduled counter intel screen, right? Why the drama? Half somewhere to be, he asks in a lilting voice. I grind my teeth. Well, you know, the president of the entire horrible da damned Altan Republic has that armistice speech or day speech to give tomorrow. And if I don't get back to it, let me be clear, Miss Camille, Commander Camille. Oof, yes, I love that. He smiles toothily, and this time I imagine miniature snakes slithering out of his mouth, ch chattering and hissing to go in for the kill. How Valheron of you, his voice oozes with derision. I suppress the shiver, but of course he catches it. The chief of staff, he continues, is the one who asked me to do a second level investigation, so I think he can forgive a slight amount of tardiness. Chief of staff, damn it, Srivani, why the hell did he jack up a routine screen? As long as I'm back by 1400, I clench my fists or my hands and release. I have a meeting with Roya herself. We wouldn't want you to be late for the actual president, I agree. Now let's go over this again, he says. When did you start fucking Emperor Ignatius I of Valhair? Oh, oh, shit. Oh, I love that ending. Uh, as I exit this interview, the claustrophobic room leads out into a claustrophobic hallway down in the ass pit of a shabby edifice, the People's House, the seat of power for the leader of the free whirl, a nondescript brick squatting on a nondescript square. As humble as possible, typical Altaian. Oh, as humble as possible, typical Altaian. Down with the pomp and circumstance, down with the gilded corridors and the stately bus. We're so afraid to admit our predations, so invested on in being the moral leaders of the world. I promptly run into Ransom, leaving the observation room to the south. You two never even kissed? 
Ransom says. You were listening in? Ugh, of course he was, because it's literally my job, he finishes, when I... What I assume is like... Oh, okay, I didn't realize he was eating. Um, He finishes what I assume is the rest of his lunch, grimacing as he picks at his teeth. Half a toothpick? Making an oof of disgust. I hand him the square of cloth I neatly folded in my pants this morning. Use this. It's got that stiff built, that built-in stiff edge, and you know you can keep it. Ransom nods and thanks as his stubby fingers dive in. Then he looks over at me, walking beside him, hands clasped behind my back, head cocked, and gives a start. What? I'm serious, I say. Can we not talk about my unexciting romantic history when we get out into the open? I'd rather the general popul the general populace not know about, well, you know. We keep walking from the pit and emerge from the basement door into glorious sunshine and the feel of a healthy gust of afternoon sea air, Craigel squawking in the distance. Ransom pokes at my shoulder with al alacrity. Alas, there are some words that I don't know how to pronounce. Uh, what in what the oh my god, what that the joint heroes of the Mazarin invasion want to boink each other the, the entire time? I do a head scan of the plaza, looking at the interns, journalists, and minor officials all around me, and turn back to him, glaring. I'm open to it with my superiors because they need to know. I my tight whisper seems to ring out over the square. Now, can you just shut it? Yes, ma'am, Commander, ma'am, he salutes. I guess that's what I'll call you now. Oh, stop. I roll my eyes. The investor of a republic was a republic reservist. I may be retired from active duty, but that's the correct form of address. That kid, already doing the kids these thing these days thing, already doing the kids these days things. Uh, you're not that old, little Layla. Youngest 05 in a generation. That's me. 26 years old when I made that rank. Okay, so now we know it's adult. Awesome. Anna. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, hardly a pimple scarred youth, but pimple cream and wine spritzer is the Republic's defense, Republic Defense Forces stock and trade. At any rate, eventually they retired me too, patting my back and telling me to stay close to the Capitol while keeping me corked in case of emergency and also for the occasional parade. He spins off for me as we re-enter the building from the street level, going wherever he goes to sit on the throne, on his throne of lies and intrigue, cracking as he or cackling as he tweaks and pulls gossamer threads of intelligence and makes minions out of men. Actually, Ransom's just the Deputy Assistant National Threats Minister for the counter-espionage and leadership profiling, but I like to pretend he's a sinister puppet master. But in a way, it's true. Altain's leaders, these powerful, mighty leaders, use spy masters like Ransom to keep dissension in line and scary bionic dudes to sniff out tra traitors. But then they turn around and talk about the public trust and going all in together. Maybe I only, only I see it. Uh, I'm the only one who's been on the other side of the divide. The only one whose foreign immersion experience is in other, free, is in other free states like Lyra and Renib, but instead the annoying militaristic repressive Valheron Empire. Interesting. Oh, this is this is cool. Uh, only someone like me could come back from that experience, that experience loving Altain, but also seeing our work clearly. A few twists and turns later, I enter uh, President Royo's austere office, which is resolutely unadorned. Generic meeting table with folding chairs on one end, on, and on the other end of her desk, a plain black slab with a cushy yet functional overstuffed swiveling chair behind it. And there's Srivani, the chief of staff, the reason for my little security update being turned into an interrogation. I lower my voice as I pass talk later. Sri has the grace to look abashed. Lails, he says, I know you're going to ask her. Armistice Day, the president says, interrupting our chatter with her throaty voice. We've got everything set up, ma'am, Sri enters, pivoting away. Logistics to and fro, security, and we've got some of those soldiers sitting behind you looking heroic. <laughs> You've got those changes incorporated, Roya asked me. Roya's only nod to the or ornamentation today is her Sharpie-inspired skirt, or Shari-inspired skirt, a stiff gold and black sensation, the petticoat underneath flaring out dramatically to make the whole thing look like a Valheron ball gown. Yeesh, Valhair's on my mind a lot. Between the interrogation and the favor I'm about to ask the president. Ma'am, I changed most of them, I say, but the phrase Requiem and Remembrance was tested to, through 20 focus groups and had the highest engagement score for our lyrical beats. Well, if the focus group likes it, Royo sighs, by all means, keep it in then. Chief speechwriter, not as glamorous as one would think. We'll keep you off the stage for this one, she continues. Don't want my opponents to think I'm milking the fact that I have a goddess be damned war hero on my staff. Now, before, about the state visit to Valhara next month. I'm still waiting on my ticket, I jump in, then clamp my hand over my mouth. Oh, shoot, I just literally interrupted the president. Srivani puts his head in his hands, a common position of his while dealing with me. Well, look, 
Obviously, Roya is effectively my superior officer, but I haven't busted my ass for all these years to be tossed aside until I'm as useful as a show pony. This is Valhair we're discussing, an empire I have actual expertise dealing with. Thankfully, all I get from Roya is an indrawn sigh and one raised brow. I'm sure Sri can handle any last minute changes to my remarks, she says. I take a deep breath before continuing. Madam President, you need to show your party you're serious about having good relations with uh, Valhair, especially with legislative elections coming up soon. Pausing, I gaze her I gauge her response. Her head cocks to the side, lips pursed in thought. Good. Ever since the end of the Mazarin War, the populace has been worried about another threat. That shadowy threat right now to them is Valhair. The more light you shine on the Empire, the more we need to remind the voters they can be friends and allies, I resume. I can help, ma'am. Not just last minute changes to speeches, but if things go awry. I don't understand them fully, but I have more experience than fine, fine, Layla. But I want you to inform the I want you in uniform for the opening ceremony then. That culture eats it up and you're part of the mythology of this war anyway. Victory of a sort. I aim to please, or I aim to serve, I tense, anticipating a flurry of good idea fairies capitalizing on the fact that the emperor and I are old war buddies. Joint appearances at a cemetery thrown together in a tick ticker tape parade, a hospital tour. We Altaeans are so far up our collective ass, we treat our own soldiers like evil necessities, shameful secrets to tuck away in hopes in hope chests until the dowry comes due, and when it is due. But President Roya keeps going, curiosity, curiously disappointing despite the fact that I loathe being shown off. The Altaian performative pacifism at work again. All right, Roya says, this is a formal state visit, not a working visit. We'll avoid the heavy topics, the rumors that they are, that they are researching tunnel construction in the empire's hinterlands is still very concerning, but my goal during this trip would be to gauge if it's even true. Regardless, other than that wrinkle, we're flying in, saying hi, dancing to some traditional songs, and going home. One month. In less than one month, I'll see him again for the first time in two years. We've sent pictures from time to time in addition to our words, sometimes silly videos to convey what we otherwise wouldn't, but we haven't talked in real, real time. Now, after a couple weeks of travel, we're speeding on our way towards Valhair, flying past Felix through the Lyrian wormhole. Oh, cool. Nice. Uh, and soon we're on approach, ice capped mountains, snow blanketing the ground. I shiver as if already cold. Signa, Altain's capital, is temperate and by the sea, fueled by seawater in the lush in the air and lush breeze. I've been to Novaria, the imperial city, only once before, when Gustav IV bestowed damehood on me for my part in pushing Mazar back to its borders. I was the first non Valheran to win that honor. Cool. Um, okay. First impressions, I absolutely love the world. I think that your world building is very subtle and sneaky, but in a way that like very much paints this idea of the society that is like very like mild. I don't know, because like I can definitely tell that Valhair is like the pomp and circumstance society. Like they're the ones with the gilded halls, they're the ones with the decorated war soldiers, they're the ones with like more attention to like the pomp and circumstance and less attention to like the the mechanics of the world um but it also sounds like they're performing better and it almost gives the appearance that altair is like this new society that is trying really hard to keep its people in line and like optimistic about the way that they're running their world um which i think is a really cool dynamic because usually when you see two countries it's like one of them is fairly established one of them is also fairly established and they have like long-standing feuds um, but what I'm getting from here is that like, like Layla was directly involved in the war that shaped Altair. Um, so if that's true, that was really, really good world building because like, that's really hard to show in the beginning of, of, of a book. Um, I am a little concerned about, well, not concerned, just confused about the setup because you make a point to say that like, there's not a lot of like new things inside this world. Like, like the president, the president doesn't even have guild in their in her office. Like she's got like a folding chair and like a mildly comfortable like chair, you know, and a folding table. Um, but then you kind of talk about like how they're going to be. I mean, I guess that's all pretty consistent though. Um, yeah. It is, it's an interesting world. It's interesting because it seems to me like they're not paying very much attention to like appearances, but then they're also trying to pay attention to appearances in this area right here, just because they're going to Valhair, which I guess is the point of Valhair, like in order to make, but it doesn't sound like they need the Valherans to like them. It sounds like they need the other Altaians to like 
Altanians um, to like the fact that they're making an alliance with Valhair. So, yeah, I mean, overall, this is really, really good world building. Um, I do think that there might need to be some smoothing out between like what the Altarans want, um, because it sounds to me like they need to be supportive of Valhair because there's an alliance between them now. But uh, I'm not getting a lot of it might just be because of the politics, honestly. I think there's a lot of politics in the very beginning, which is cool. But I don't know enough about these worlds to know why I care just yet. Um, what's far more interesting to me than like this kind of discussion on page six is uh, is that her like illicit affair almost with this with the the emperor of Valhair. I absolutely love this line. When did you start fucking Emperor Ignatius the first of Valhair? Especially the fact that he's got like the first there because it's just like oh he's he just got this position like. And like you, you make that very clear that like he just got this position, and that is why her her own chief of staff is very concerned about the fact that she was with him. So it sounds to me like okay, so like you've got Altair, and then you've got Valhair, and Valhair is like Valhair is where Emperor Ignatius is going to be commanding, and then Altair is where Layla works. But there was a war that probably established Altair. Yeah, this is some good world building. If if what I'm saying is true, then you did a really good job because it's intriguing enough that I want to sit and puzzle through it. Um, but it's not like it's so in my face that I'm getting overwhelmed. I do think that there is a lot about like the pomp and circumstance here. And I think I could use maybe even just another couple lines, like a couple throwaway lines about like telling. Like you don't always have to show. You can tell some things, especially in the beginning like this. Um, to keep me from having to puzzle through this kind of stuff. Um, and I think that that would be really useful in regards to like the way that she's talking. Um, like, I'm not going to lie, there was a lot of conversation with her and the president and I was trying to be focused on it, but I feel like mostly I was just interested in what Layla was going to be doing when she meets Ignatius. So I'm not sure that like this entire scene over here, like all of this where she's talking to the president, I know that there's important things that they're talking about here. I just didn't care. <laughs> Yet, because I'm so concerned with Layla and her and her rank as a 26 year old that got retired and then her like relationship with Ignatius, like that's where the reader is right now. Um, so all of this political stuff right off the bat might be a little heavy for what we're doing, especially when I feel like most of it could be shown once they reach Valheron. Um, I'm not really sure if it's necessary for us to see this kind of stuff now. Um, I think what would be a better use for this conversation with Roya is if she, like Layla, kind of goes in and maybe calls out the elephant in the room. Like somebody, Srivana was the one, or Srivani was the one who asked about, you know, the security update being turned into an interrogation. Like, but Srivani probably got their orders from Roya. So I guess I kind of want to see, like, Layla, this, like, no nonsense, like, commander at 26 years old who has been retired at 26 because it's not, she doesn't fit in with the image of this world. I kind of want to see her going in and being like, and like calling this out in public where she's just kind of like, is my relationship with the emperor that much of a concern to you? And then maybe Roya kind of goes in from like a political stance from that point where it kind of shows the difference between like, like the, uh, um, it kind of shows the difference between like the, like the military side of things and like the political side of things. Um, so I see, uh, my original had more telling and I literally just changed it. Yeah. I, it, it's kind of a tricky balance. Um, okay. All right. Okay. Stop, stop, stop. Sorry. My dog, my dogs are over here. Um, okay. Hang on. Come here. Come here and say hello. This is, this is Scouty. She is my, my sister's dog. And, uh, she is a very angry, angry child because she likes to bark. You can tell she's looking out the window. What are you doing? Say hello. Say hello. Um, yeah, not yeah. Sammy is also being upset. You probably can you can see him right here. Sammy, hi. <laughs> you probably can't really see his face. Anyway, um, okay. So this reminds me a lot of uh, I don't know if you've ever played Mass Effect, um, but this reminds me a lot of Mass Effect um, in the way that like Commander Shepard is like very very political. Like they hired her literally to like head like to investigate a thing that ended up being like the war of the galaxy right and so like the entire time she was just like this this like 
I mean, she's in her thirties, I think, but like, she's like this fairly young, really like deadpan, very like badass commander who just like goes in and like starts to navigate the politics from a war standpoint. So if you've never played that game, I highly recommend it because the way that they handled like that kind of, oh, thank you. Uh, Sam, Sam just gifted me his ball, how sweet. Um, the way that they kind of handled that like dichotomy between like the, the soldier coming in and then having to play politics um, was really, really interesting, especially with the way that the world dynamics were. And I actually think that if you play that game, you could probably get a lot out of it in order to kind of channel it here. Um, the one thing that I actually have a really big concern with in this is that I don't know what genre it is. I'm inclined to think it's sci-fi because you mentioned bionics and wormholes. Um, but if it's sci-fi, I'm going to need to know a little bit more about the placement of these worlds because if they're on two different planets and you need a wormhole to get from one to the other, I kind of want to know what the direct threat is to Altair or Altain. Um, I kind of want to know what the direct threat to Altain is because it's not like these people could like march across the borders. Like if they're coming in from a, from a, from a planet standpoint, they're going to have to have ships that would land and like come into the atmosphere. And then I would want to know like what kind of defenses would Altain have had for that? Or like, is that what the battle was? You know, like, like you talk about this, um, this war and this battle that like made her a war hero. Um, I want to know more about how that war was fought. Like, was it a space battle kind of like Star Wars? Or was it more like, like, maybe they're take like, like they take like a special like localized wormhole that's like a big gate and then it like transports them directly to um Valhain's borders and maybe they set that wormhole up on their planet and then it would be fantasy kind of it'd still be like a sci-fi but like a planet-based sci-fi so i guess that's what i want to know like is this a sci-fi is it a fantasy i'm leaning more towards sci-fi just because you don't typically see those things in fantasy but uh, if it's a if it's a sci-fi, immediately we need to know whether or not it's taking place on multiple planets or one planet, and why they're so concerned about Valhair potentially being a threat to their republic. Um, because it doesn't seem to me if they're on a different planet like it's going to be that immediate of a threat, unless they have a lot of different like if if Altain is a new world, I could see how Valhair would then need to be like Valhair could then be a more established world and then they could be concerned about them trying to take over. But like, were they, were they citizens of Valhair before the war or did like, who owned them before the war? Like, I guess there's, there is world building in this beginning chapter, but there's not the right kinds of world building. I think, you know, like we need to figure out, like, like make it very simple for us. Take it right down to the basics. Like where is Altain physically? Where is Valhair physically? Where did the war take place? And then you mentioned a little later, um, you mentioned uh, um, Novaria, and we've never even heard of Novaria before this point. So like, where is the Imperial city? Where is, where, where is all of this? Like this entire paragraph, I, we don't really have any context for where or what is physically happening. And I think that's why the politics over here is kind of falling short for me is because I don't really understand like what genre this is or where these countries physically are. So when you start to get into like the political strife between them, it's a little confusing to me. Um, yeah, it's a little confusing to me. Uh, okay, um, otherwise, the only other thing that I really had to say was, um, I'm not so sure, I don't know, that was pretty interesting. I, I wanna know more about Ransom. Um, not this. Um, first of all, I do think that we need to figure out who the in investigator is because he's like the guy who kicks off this entire thing, the interrogator. We know next to nothing about him. He has no personality. Um, just because, and I think that's by design. Like I think that he's not meant to have a personality. Um, fun fact: a little bit of a little bit of a of an aside here. Um, my degree was criminal justice in um, college, and. I actually had the, the ability, um, I had the opportunity at one point to go in and get an internship with the FBI in DC. Um, and so I got an FBI polygraph done um, and I failed it, <laughs> um, which is funny to me because if you know me, I grew up in uh, like Mormonville Central in Gilbert, Arizona, which is like the Salt Lake City of Arizona. Um, and I mean, I'm not Mormon, but we had that influence all around us. And like, I was very like, our idea of a game in high school was like Monopoly, right? Like I did not drink until I had one drink at 18 and then I didn't drink again until I was 21. Um, like I, I was like the most straight laced person you've ever seen. But when I went in for the, um, polygraph, they hooked me up to all those machines and then they decided that 
I was uh, I was involved in drugs and serious crime, which like to the FBI is like that's not like normal drugs and serious crime. That's like trafficking children across state lines kind of thing, right? And I was just like, what? Like I think I'm like 19 years old, and I'm just like, oh my god, you know. <laughs> Um, anyway, so whenever I see something about a lie detector test, like there's like this thing in me that's just kind of like they're fake, they're terrible, blah, 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 you know? And so like, I love that she's like, they're easy to beat because I mean, they really are like the honest people fail them. And then the, the people who are pathological liars and can control their heartbeat don't. Um, but because I know that I actually kind of, for me personally, I kind of want to know why she knows that they're easy to beat. Like maybe give me a hint of like more here. Like, did she have to beat lie, lie detector tests when she was, fighting in the war, you know, like, did she get captured at one point and have to like lie her ass off to get away? Um, also, I am wondering why they use a lie detector test in this, like, I mean, like, this seems very um, archaic, I guess, like the way that she's hooked up to this lie detector test is very true to how we have lie detector tests. Um, and I want to know why they have the lie detector test, but then they also have the bionic contacts. Why wouldn't they just nix this and then use this? Um, so I guess I want to see a little bit more world building in that regard um, to make things pretty consistent. Like maybe the lie detector test is like an old um, Altane a full scope. Poly yeah, no, the full scope polys. Um, sorry, uh, Maya just said um, that uh, she takes she has the she's taken a full scope polygraph before and it's not fun. And I'm like, yeah, no, they're they're they suck. Like they're easily, I think that was the most stressed I've ever been in my life. Like I'm sitting over there just like sweating bullets. Cause I'm like, I'm, I'm telling the truth, but boy, they never knew it, you know, based on that test. Um, and so I guess I want to see a little bit more like, like, like maybe they pulled this ancient lie detector test out. Maybe this is an Altane thing, but then the bionic contacts are more like Valhallen where like they're very, um, futuristic, I guess, compared to like the more practical setup that Altane has. Um, but I almost think you could, if you were going to go in that route, you could almost make some kind of like line between it where it's like, yes, like Altane, you know, Altane is very uh, like chronic and like unimpressive, I guess. Like they don't use a lot of the pomp and circumstance. They don't have the fancy gadgets maybe, but the gadgets that they do have are not very good, you know? Um, so I think that that, yeah, no, they are, they are. Thank you, T. Yeah. T said, uh, from what I remember, polygraph tests are about as accurate as a coin toss. They are. Um, the creator of the test actually said he he like released it to the world and then five years later realized how it was being ingrained into society. And he had to come back in and be like, they're not true. They're fake. They don't work. Take them away. But by then the government was kind of like, we found a lie detector test. And they were so excited about it that they just like latched on and, and it's been what 40 years that they've never let go so um anyway so I, I guess the the way because i know that about the lie detector test uh, this would seem very weird to me to have those kind of like that dichotomy between the technology um but i do think that uh okay come here come here sorry oh guess who's been bothering me here's another puppy this is sammy hi guys he is he's very upset because i'm not playing with him yeah, and now he's and now he's gonna pretend like he's been a perfect angel this entire time, but also look out the window because I've lifted him up to the window. So Sammy, say look up here, look up here. He's actually very good at FaceTiming, but only when he sees somebody else. Like he sees himself in the in the screen and then he gets all excited, but when he doesn't see himself, he, he won't. Anyway, um, yeah, okay, so moving on. Uh so one of the other things, uh yeah, I was saying about ransom. Um, I don't really feel like where did ransom go? Okay. Um, so this part down here, I don't know anything about Ransom except that he's the spy master. And again, I kind of want to see a little bit more of like the character building here. Like when he says you two never even kissed, this implies that he knows more from Layla's perspective. But like, do they have a history in the war? Um, or like, did she just meet him because of their jobs now? You know, like I want to know more of like those details. Like how are these characters orbiting around Layla? Like where is their relation to her? Um, because I think that that's going to make a big difference as to, into how this like seeing is perceived, you know, like if, if Ransom is her brother, that would make a big difference versus if he's just some random coworker that she was thrown in with. Like if he's her brother and he asks you two never even kiss, then he might actually know that that's not true. Or he might just be like, we legit all thought that you were fucking, you know, but uh, if he's just some random spy master, I mean, I guess because of his job, it would still make sense that he would know that, like, he would then be questioning at that point whether or not he's any good at his job because he thought that they kissed and he's the spy master, so he should know, you know? Um, so I guess I want to know more about Ransom in, like, that capacity. Like, where can his character, like, even just a couple lines to kind of give us background into how we know 
other than like I probably run into ransom and then we don't know anything about him or like what his point is. I also, this, this threw me, he finishes what I assume is the rest of his lunch. That threw me for a loop because you never mentioned he was eating. Um, so maybe make sure that you like pull those things down if you're going to be having comments like that. Uh, the final thing that I'll say about your writing before I go check out your query is that your writing, like your world building is really, really cool. I love like the, like the ascension instead of like, you know, like, like that's such a, an interesting word for like a promotion of the emperor, you know, like a crowning of the emperor. Um, but uh, I also want to, I, I think it would help help you to read your stuff out loud before, like when you're going through an editing, like read it out loud to yourself because there were a couple sentences that I would stutter on when I was reading it out loud. And I know that's just because I'm not great at reading things uh -huh. out loud, um, especially early in the morning. But I also think that there are some of the, like some of the way that this stuff is phrased um, could be rephrased. And I think you'll find those sentences just by reading this out loud. Um, that's actually a really good tip for anybody who's going to be writing. If you're in like the final stages of like sentence editing, I read everything out loud. Um, because partly because I like the experience of reading things out loud, but mostly because it helps me find where like things looked pretty on paper, but then when I read them out loud, they kind of stutter. Um, and that's important for if you ever have an audiobook, um, or if you have a character or like a person who's reading to their kids out loud, you know, you want them to be able to. Like, I don't think they'd be reading this book out loud because it's it's an adult. But uh, I do think that that is useful for when you're writing to make the sentences seem like they're a little more flowy. Um, OK, yeah, overall, awesome job. Really loved it. Uh, did not realize that this was a date. Um, but uh, Matthias definitely commented and said, um, oh, no, that's the date. OK, the 16th. I thought he said the 16th, but he said uh, you can change the date on the title of the stream. Now it says the 16th. Isn't it the 16th? Oh, it's the 15th. <laughs> it's the 15th. Um, anyway, okay, we're moving on. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, so this is the query letter. Dear personalization, while fighting together to repel invading forces from outside the galactic quarrel, uh, patriotic and loyal, or, yeah, patriotic and loyal commander Layla Camille of the Altain Republic fell in love with the dashing Valheran noble. Now he's the new emperor of Valhair and he asks her to marry him. Ooh, I love that. Uh, for once, putting love over duty, she agrees. Two years later, Layla is the emperor. Oh, two years later. Wow. So this all, okay, this is so interesting to me. Uh, two years later, Layla is the empress and has overcome her initial culture shock from the mil militaristic and hierarchical empire. Um, but war breaks out, pitting Altain and its enemies against Valhair. In the midst of the conflict, her husband's cousin goes missing after last minute negotiations with Altain. Pro uh, protests erupt against the emperor and his right to rule, and she finds herself the target of unknown assassinations with neuro weapons. The longer the war goes on, the less safely Le believes herself, her unborn child, and her family to be, and the less likely Layla would ever be welcomed back into her re home republic should she need to flee. Uh, making matters worse, instability in the world leaves all of its planets vulnerable to hostile forces. Okay, so planets, okay. Um, the same subjugating every civilization in its wake conquerors who had invaded before. Uh, Layla has to overcome her du dual loyalty and figure out how to end this war once and for all. At stake is not only her freedom and safety, but the stability and independence of the entire world. The Starcrossed Empire is a 114,000 word adult science fiction novel evoking the close knit galactic politics and court intrigue of the Vorkorsigan, so I don't know how to pronounce that, Vorkorsigan for saga and the upcoming novel Winter's Orbit and its split loyalties of Bonds and Brass and Lost Stars. It is own voices for South Asian heritage and its portrayal of asexuality. Told in dual timeline, it features Layla's slow burn first person narrative about acclimating to fall hair, which informs the fast paced third person present day timeline about the war. Uh, I'm a political science nerd who attended the School of Foreign Service at Georgetown University, a former counterterrorism officer, wow, um, and have worked in politics and journalism. Currently, I am a stay at home mother with three children and I write to keep my brains from atrophying to, due to the endless rounds of Kalayu. Kalyu. Um, thank you for your time and consideration, period. Um, okay, so this gave me a lot of information, actually, um, which is great. So let me, let me go up to, like, the actual query portion of this. So this did give me a lot of information. This immediately set the stage. But I think it is important, as you notice, like, I purposely skipped this because I didn't want to know any of this stuff going into the query letter. Obviously, agents are different. They want to know if it's even worth their time to read the pages. But, uh... 
I didn't know that there were planets. I didn't know that it was that kind of a sci-fi. And I think that that is important for you to remember in a first chapter, because there's a chance that they're not even going to read the back of the book. They might just pick up the first cover and read the first couple sentences. And if they don't immediately have a centering area into like the world and like the world building, um, that's going to be really difficult. And I think that that's something very, very tough to do in fantasy and sci-fi, because you do only have two pages, maybe one, you know, to, to kind of set us in what type of world this is. Um, so I think that uh, that kind of thing is very important to know. Um, I wasn't, based on what the beginning of that was, and I can see why this is 114,000 words, um, just because like you did take the time to kind of establish her situation within the Altain Republic before she goes to marry um, the Emperor of Valhair. Uh, but I am not so sure that all of that stuff is super necessary for establishing because like the whole point of this at the very end is that she's got these like dual citizenship like dual loyalty opportunities you know but uh nothing about the way that she was talking about Altain made me really feel like she was super patriotic to them it kind of made me feel like she was being pushed aside by them um and like because of her like she she was a war hero like she was in this war where they fought off the um conquerors and I assume that that was that was the 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 war that they were fighting and was fighting off those conquerors. But uh, nothing about the way that she was being treated by the people in her own society made me think that she would have very many loyalties towards it. You know, like she didn't seem to view the gilded hallways of Valhair very um, like disdainfully, you know, like she wasn't really like, like it, it wasn't like she was looking at all the things that were, that were the Altain Republic and being like, we make so much sense compared to Valhara. Like Valhara is so needlessly excessive. They're so, you know, like, oh my gosh, all the pomp and circumstance. It was more kind of like in Valhara, soldiers can be soldiers. And in the Altain Republic, we're only like put on a pedestal when we need to be for a political standpoint, you know? And so like none of that really implies to me that she would have like die hard, crazy loyalty to her country. Um, so I almost wonder if there's a better way to introduce her in the beginning of this story. Like, I'm not even sure if what we just read is the best way to to begin this story. Um, just because I think that the most important thing to accomplish based on this query is that she is going to have dual loyalty. So that when he asks her to marry, it is very much one of those things where she's kind of like, I... Uh, like I, I was Altain and now you are making me Valhair and I have to choose. And that's a very big, that's a very big choice. You know, like that would be a huge inciting incident for him to offer marriage and then for her to have to leave her home country in that regard. Um, one of the other things that I'm kind of thinking is that, you know, you mentioned that there's a uh, asexuality, which is amazing. Um, but uh, unfortunately, based on the way that the world works, when you start to mention her unborn child and then you mention, you know, like that she was like, like in love with him, most people are going to assume that that's going to be a normal relationship. Now I'm demisexual. I, I aim actually probably a little closer to the asexuality side of the spectrum. So like, I completely understand what this is. Um, but most people probably wouldn't be thinking that. So I almost wonder when you have down here, um, when she says, uh, or when Ransom says, you never even kissed, I almost want to see some internal thought on Layla's side where she's kind of like, ooh, kissing, gross, you know, or like, of course, we've never kissed. Why would we kiss? You know, like something kind of that kind of puts, you know, us in the perspective that like she views this as something that is not even necessary because, you know, or however her asexuality pans out like that. But put us in that perspective so that we know at this moment that there is something different about the way that this relationship will be, um, because I think that that'll be really intriguing. You know, like that is not something we usually see in science fiction um, or in books in general. And I think that it's really important to address that those kind of relationships exist. So I would definitely be amping that up here, especially because you have a nice lead in with that. Um, in regards to the way that the query pans out, um, I actually like the, the, the setup of this, um, but I am unclear about why after two years she would think that it's okay to go back um, to her home republic especially when war broke out here between the two so it's not like like she at this point has left altain and allied herself with valhair so when this part happens and everybody and like matters get worse and uh and this like subjugating every civilization in its wake conquerors 
um, invade, I don't know why she would ever think that it's an opportunity to go back to Altane. Um, that doesn't really make a lot of sense to me. It seems to me like she's been living in Valhair. She's formed a family in Valhair. Um, she obviously agreed to marry him because she doesn't really feel a ton of, I mean, she can still feel loyalty to the Altane Republic. And I do think that that like dichotomy will be very interesting inside her soul, but I don't know why she would think that that is an acceptable place to go unless she still had family in Altane and was kind of like, I have to protect them too. And then this war would just be like grating on her in that regard. Cause like what dramatic, like dramatics when she has like family in Altane and like loyalty to Altane, but then she also wants to protect Valhair, but then they're in conflict with each other. Um, like that's a, that's a lot of conflict right there, which is great. Um, but I'm not really sure why her first impulse is to go back to Altane when, when this, when they're threatened by other conquerors. Um, yeah, the last kind of thing that I'll, sorry, see me squeaking a ball now. Okay, see me, stop, come here, bring that, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, the, uh, the last kind of thing that I'll say about this before I'll kind of close off this live stream is, uh, let me see here. Um, yeah, I think for the for the setup of this query letter specifically, um, I would definitely mention the um <laughs> Oscar the squeak and was like called, yeah, yeah, Sammy is very, he's very upset about the ball. Um, the last kind of thing that I would definitely mention for this query letter is if you're rewriting it, I would mention these guys up here. Um, because she didn't just fall in love with the dashing Valheran noble, she was fighting alongside him against these people. So I would definitely make sure to mention these people in like paragraph one and like that's how. So like maybe instead of she fell in love with a dashing Valheran noble, she could be like she fought alongside a dashing Valheran noble um, in this war against these people. And then when he becomes the emperor and asks her to marry him, she has like a way bigger history over that. Um, but I, I would definitely mention these people before, because if you're going to put them in the query letter, which you don't really even need to, um, except maybe in the very last sentence to kind of like mention what's at stake. Um, but like, it seems to me like most of the book is going to be this conflict between Altane and Valhair, and then it's kind of like an end game, like the longer the war goes on. So this is kind of like a building you up for a trilogy kind of end game. Um, and that kind of story structure will be interesting if that's the case. But, uh, I would definitely mention these guys higher up if that is what you're going to be doing. Um, Maya, we can definitely talk more about this. If, if any of these things kind of raise concerns or questions, um, definitely shoot me a message and we can talk more about it. Uh, you have a lot of really, really good world building in here and a lot of really like intense political setups. And I think that like this background is so important because it kind of sets it up where I'm just like, wow, you're really going to know what is going on with like terrorism, what is going on with like politics in this kind of war, like how war heroes might be treated, how like the spy master could be like, I think that all of that is going to be really, really interesting to see um in regards to that uh definitely check out mass effect and i know it's a long game skip number one just go straight to number two but like the way that commander shepherd works in that in that trilogy feels very much like layla to me here which immediately piques my interest because i love that kind of stuff so um so yeah nice job overall very very good um and i really can't wait to hear more and uh i guess that's kind of where i'll end things here today um Oh, uh, my my book is actually having a holiday sale. Um, I think I mentioned it on my Twitter and I know I mentioned it on my Instagram, but uh, my book is having a holiday sale. So if you buy with the link that I provided down below um, and use the code HOLIDAY30, you can get 30% off of pre-ordering my book, The Secrets of Star Whales. Uh, so if you guys are interested in doing that, um, any pre-order would help me out a lot. It all goes towards the first week of sales, um, which again is how you get on the like you know, bestseller lists and, uh, you know, and how it kind of sets the stage for um, your publisher to be like, oh, wow, this is a really high selling author because, you know, you get um, all these first sales in the first week, which would be great. Um, so if you guys have some extra cash or you want to buy a, a, a present that won't come until March, um, feel free to buy that book. The link is down below. And I really appreciate everybody's support in that matter. Um, and I'll definitely be doing more of these critiques as I progress. So thank you guys so much. Uh, have a good night and I will talk to you later. Bye.